All right, floppies, welcome back to episode two as we do a little guide to the ABC Warrior game. Now, we went through the first 10 pages, which were kind of the core rules. Was it 10 pages? 12 pages we got through. It was basically an overview of the game. And we did end on close combat stats. So the next page in the book you will see is Order and Chaos. This is going to get covered later in the book, but every character is on the path or resisting order and chaos throughout the game. This artwork's lovely. This is something that's going to turn up later in the book, page 52-55, so we're not going to worry about covering that just yet and confusing everyone. We're going to cover 14 to 22 today, if you're reading along with me. It's going to be all about the game turn. So, like a lot of Warlord games, they use turn activators, which I absolutely adore. It means that you're always possibly playing throughout a turn. It's very rare that one person takes over a turn for a long period of time. You always get to do something with their game. So in this version, they use action chips, which we covered a little bit in the last video. Every model gets an action chip. Goes in the bag. If your chip is pulled out, you get to play. So at the start of the game, you will need one action chip for each model under your control. Group models provide one action chip per group, not per model. Each player uses different color chips, so you know what you've got. If your model has a cool of four, you put in a star chip. These are special, so uh, ones that spring to mind, Hammerstein, Blackblood, named characters usually have a cool of four or more, and it lets them do something special. And then one at a time you draw the chips from the bag, handing the chip to the end of player when it is drawn, and then they take their turn. If it is your turn to play an action chip, you can make a single action, so the examples they are given here, move or take a snapshot. A double action would be sprinting and taking an aim shot. A model can select any model on the tabletop that they control, and it has to be one that doesn't already have an action chip next to it. Once a model has completed its turn, you leave the chip next to it so you know it's done. The only time this is different is when you are activating a star chip. Star chips let your model go for broke and you do a test against their cool stat. If you roll a 2000 AD symbol, the chip goes back in the bag, allowing you, in theory, to constantly keep going. You don't have to use a star chip on a hero character. You could use it on your normal troops or a group of troops, but because they got a lower cool stat, it's harder to get the chip back in the bag. It depends what you're trying to do in game. If you've got a plan of action, go for it. If not, maybe uh, save it for your heroes that can do this. If you fail to get the 2000 AD on your rolls, which seems to happen a lot more often than I'd like to admit, you become pinned if you're a floppy or you suffer a metal fatigue if you're a robot. If it's the last bag, last chip in the bag, you can still go for broke, but it has a minus two cool modifier applied to this and all other tests trying to get the chip back in. So in theory you could keep going, keep going, but you will ultimately fail at some point. Little new rule that has appeared in the game is the action chip cap. This is new. Uh, you could definitely use this as well in Judge Dredd and Strontium Dogs. It makes a lot of sense. It is a good system. Ultimately, if smaller force, so your ABC Warriors cost a lot more in points. So they're always usually going to be a smaller force. So if you've only got one model, your opponent can only ever have two chips in his bag, and this goes all the way through. This is to represent the elite troops being able to work better than your more cheaper troops. It's a very good system, I very much enjoy it, but it's definitely new, something that I'm going to have to learn myself when playing these games. So you have to be more coordinated. It doesn't matter if you're playing against somebody who's got one Hammerstein, you're only ever going to have two chips. doesn't matter if you have five models on the board. You're only going to move two of them a turn. So you have to be very coordinated. Otherwise, you're just sending your troops in to die. And of course, there's more rules for this section. But ultimately, as you get casualties in your larger force, you don't have to remove chips until you have less models than the chip allowance. So let's say you were a unit of five chips, but you've got seven models. You keep five chips in the bag until you hit five. 
Then when you hit five or less, you start removing the chips. You don't have to remove a chip every time you lose a model, otherwise you'd be pulling no chips and still have models on the board. If you happen to have characters in the larger force that generate a star chip, when they are took out of action, the star chip is turned into a normal chip. You do not get to keep the star chip. I know that'd be wonderful, but mm -mm -mm, you can't cheat. And then smaller forces, the cap is unaffected if they lose models. So, and then it also says at the bottom here, the action a chip cap can be applied to all other 2000 AD games, which makes sense to end a game or ending the game turn. Gather up all your action chips that have been placed, check scenario conditions to make sure there's no reinforcements arriving, and check to see if the game ends. If it doesn't, you begin the next round. Ending the game comes in the scenarios, so we'll worry about that later. And multiplayer has its own set of rules. I will rarely be doing multiplayer, but it's pretty straightforward. Actions. So you've drawn your star chip, it's your turn to move a model. You have a choice of two options. You can do two single actions or one double action. Single actions include move the model, snap shoot a weapon, throw a weapon, fight in close combat, or shake it off where you remove your pinned markers if you're a floppy, or metal fatigue if you're a robot, or stunned markers. Double actions, you can aim and then shoot at your weapon with a bonus. You can sprint, which is two times your move plus d6. You can charge, where you move plus a d6 and then make a close combat attack. You can jump or climb. You can set overwatch or you can hunker down in order to remove even harder injuries. You nominate these as you're doing them. You don't have to say, hey, I'm doing these two actions. You do one, then you do the next one. You don't have to declare them both at the same time. So moving, it's pretty straightforward. You have a six inch bubble if that's your move rating and you can move anywhere within that six inch bubble. Terrain will affect this, but we'll cover that later. Snap shoot, it's pretty much like shooting. It is, you're just shooting from your hip. The only difference is if you decide to do the aimed action, you have more chances of shooting, but snap shooting is pretty much a standard move. Throwing a weapon, very rare you're gonna do that, but sometimes you will. Fighting in close combat, you've already made it to three inches. You just start swinging. You don't need to do anything special and shake it off. Let you remove your pinned and stunned markers. If you have multiple guns, you can have a gun in each hand, which is very common on quite a few of these models that I've seen. You can shoot both. It has to be a pistol or a stormer. It can't be a bigger weapon than that because obviously you need two hands for your big weapons. Your model's fire arc becomes focused front. We covered that in the front first video. It's a smaller arc in the front of your model. The attacking model who's using multiple guns adds plus one shoot for each extra weapon being fired that is within the range and picks one weapon to supply the range modifier. If a hit is scored, the lowest power of the weapons being used is the difference. The target gains a plus one resist because you're not very accurate. You're using quality over quantity. Then we get into the double actions. These have tokens to represent that you've done certain things. So sprint is your move times two plus a d6. Very straightforward. You can only turn once, as I've seen here. Boop, boop. You can only charge or run, sorry, in your front arc. So the front half of the model, he's gone that way. Now he's gone that way. Pretty straightforward. If you've played these games before, most of these rules are going to sound familiar. Charging can only be done in your front arc. You get to run, get your bonus move, and then you get to attack in close combat. Aimed fire. Pretty much shooting anyone in your front arc, you get plus two combat dice to your shoot stat. Some weapons require you to aim. You have gotta keep that in mind when you have got those weapons on your models. Overwatch, you put this little token next to them. If somebody moves into your front fire arc, you are allowed to shoot at them. Pretty straightforward, very easy to understand. Hunker down, you find some cover, you roll number dice equal to your resist stat, and then for every armor dice rolled, you get to remove a leak or injury to a minimum of one. You don't get to remove them all, but you can get yourself back down to one, which can keep you in the game. Group models, right? Now, if you've watched my unboxing of one of the robot ones, I completely misunderstood the group model rule. Luckily, a uh, follower pointed it out to me, and now I slightly understand it better. So all models in a group must choose the same actions when activated. Groups 
only ever produce one chip. You don't get a chip per model. So if you got a group of three, it's only one chip. All models in the group are targeted individually and take wounds individually. That's also important. When you're positioning your groups, make sure your most injured models uh, getting hidden away from your shooters so they don't get targeted and pinged off. All models in a group must end their activation within three inches of at least one other model from the group. When the group attacks in ranged or close combat, you pick a single model to make the attack. Any other models in the group which join the attack add their shoot and fight stats to the attacking model. Very confusing when they write it like that, but ultimately the more of your group that shoots at a target, the more likely you are to hit it. Group size. Group models include a bracket. In this example, up to three can be part of the group. Merging groups. If a group is below its maximum size due to losses, it can expend an action to merge with another group of models nearby. Models merging must be of the same type and within three inches. The active group cannot exceed its maximum size by adding merged models. Models from the active group and the models merging with it can make a move action and have to stay within three inches of each other. So if you've took some injuries, you've got two robots left of one group one of another they can merge together in game which is pretty cool no freedom of action so we're still under group models here many robots especially the early ones like the ak-47s and the mk-1 hammersteins are early soldiers and they are denied full freedom of their action unlike the heroes that means they have a limited set of commands they do this because the unit is pretty cheap compared to the heroes so you don't want them being able to do superheroic things they're more cannon fodder -esque models. So they can move, they can snap shoot, they can aim fire, they can merge, or they can shake it off. That is it. The way I like to imagine it, it's your hero giving them an order. So you, let's say you're activating a group of Hammerstein Mark 1s, you tell them to advance, they're allowed to move and snap shoot. If you tell them to hold their ground, they're allowed to aim fire. If you tell them to regroup, they can merge with another unit or they can shake off injuries. That is it. They can only do that. That is it. Otherwise, if you use a star chip on them, which could be a bit of a waste, you give them the freedom to do other stuff. So I don't know, most of the time you're probably using advance. So this was two single actions. So you could do a double move or a move and a snapshot or two snapshots. Hold uses up both actions because it's a two action point move. And same with these. These are ones and ones and stuff. So groups are interesting. We'll see how they play out. I feel this game uses groups a lot more than the other games in the past. Slain was pretty good for it. Judge Dread less so. I'm pretty sure a lot of the groups that were in Judge Dread it was just the Juve squads for the gangers and uh, civilians. But I feel in this ABC Warrior one you're going to use them a lot more. And that brings us to page 22 which is the ranged attack and we will go over that in the next video. I hope uh, this is helpful to people. Let me know in the comments if it is. If there's something you need me to go back over or you've spotted an issue with what I've taught you, let me know and I will catch you in the next video. As always, cheers for watching. Well, boy.